number of events. My name is Fabrizio Guariglia. I'm the director of uh, the, the Hague Office of uh, IDLO, the International Development Law Organization. We are the only intergovernmental organization solely devoted to uh, the promotion of the rule of law and human rights. And it's an honor for us to be here co-sponsoring this event. Um, we are going to have four speakers today who are going to share uh, experiences from different formats. We have um, some national studies, national case studies. We'll hear about Ukraine. We'll hear about rule of law issues in Colombia and uh, systems of accountability and how they are contributing to the consolidation of the rule of law. But we will also hear about regional instruments devoted to the promotion and protection of human rights, and in particular, experiences related to the African Court for uh, Human and People's Rights and uh, issues of access to justice and how the court is contributing also to the promotion of human rights and the consolidation of the rule of law. A couple of things here for you to, um, uh, to know. Participation is much welcome during the plenary. As a matter of fact, if you don't ask questions, it's going to be a very short event. So uh, we encourage you, once we open for Q&A, to raise your hand, ask questions, challenge the speakers, you know, share with us your, your views about the rule of law and, and human rights. Um, then we will basically start with the speakers, each of them five minutes to introduce themselves and to share with you uh, a, an experience. Uh, that's going to be a short presentation of five minutes. And then I will ask some follow-up questions, and then I will open the floor to all, to all of you. So let me introduce who we have here. We have Judge Fatsa Ogerus. He's an independent international arbitrator in commercial and investment arbitration and a founding member of the African Foundation for International Law. He previously chaired the United Nations Commission of Inquiry on Burundi um, and was one of the first 11 judges of the African Court on Human and People's Rights based in Arusha, Tanzania. He served the court from 2006 to 2016 and served as vice president from 2012 to 2013. He was also secretary of the International Court of Justice here in The Hague, where he practiced for 12 years before his election to the African Court. And previously, he served as a human rights officer in Rwanda for the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. So welcome, Judge. A pleasure to have you here. We have Judge Alejandra Sandoval Mantilla from Colombia. She's currently a justice at the Chamber for Amnesty or Pardon uh, and the chairperson for gender equality, uh, of, of the Gender Equality Commission of Colombia's Special Jurisdiction for Peace, the unique uh, accountability mechanism created as a result of the peace agreements in, in Colombia. Um, uh, in addition, she has been a senior lawyer at the NGO Women's Link Worldwide, a clerk at the State Council of Colombia, and a senior lawyer at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, based in Costa Rica. Um, and she has lectured in several academic institutions and participated in seminars in many Latin American countries. She's the author of two books and several scholarly articles. So welcome, Judge, as well. Then we have... Rivai Albaik, she's a senior advisor for justice and security for the rule of law, security and human rights team at the Crisis Bureau at UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. That was good. Uh, she has over 20 years of uh, working on governance and more specifically on human rights, justice, security, rule of law, social cohesion, and gender equality. Rivai has extensive experience in uh, gaining several countries in Southern Africa and the Pacific region. And besides UNDP, Rivai worked for various institutions, including UN Women, uh, ISOS Foundation, and Zimbabwe Women Lawyers Association. And finally, we have Levan Ducitze. It's his IDLO's country manager uh, in Ukraine since 2016. Before joining IDLO, Levan served as Deputy Secretary of the National Security Council of Georgia, as Ambassador of Georgia to Germany, and a Member of Parliament in Georgia. His experience also includes election observation with International Society for Fair Elections and Democracy. He has been working with the Ukraine Office of the Public Prosecutor as an external advisor for, for many years. He is the coordinator of the programs that IDLO uh, runs in Colombia, chiefly now including the programs on anti-corruption and in support of the Office of the Prosecutor General in their ongoing accountability efforts. So we have a very impressive panel today. So we're going to start uh, with you, Judge, for five minutes. If floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Actually, I don't know where to start, you know. <laughs> uh, 
I'm Fatsou Gouguz, I'm from Algeria. Uh, I, am, I am born in France. Uh, I would say that I, what I said last week in Arusha to my honorable colleagues, uh, Chief Justices of Africa, I'm a product of colonialism. Um, my parents immigrated during the Algerian war. Um, my parents are illiterate, they don't know how to read or to, uh, to read or to write either French, Berber, or Arabic, none of the language, so they are totally illiterate. My father was a coal miner. And uh, as I said last week, he, for him it was very important. Justice was more important than food. He was uh, filing many cases against uh, his employers in France, and he had, we had issues of land in Algeria. He was filing also um, cases, and all the money was going to the lawyers, you know. And we didn't have, a, I didn't dare to ask for books because I thought that I was 12 years old, I remember. And my father said, no, no, I have to pay the lawyer. I said, but I, I need also books. We need also toys, you know. And justice is more important. I, I cannot stand injustice. I can bear, I can bear uh, hunger, but not injustice. So I don't know why this may be uh, infiltrated, I mean, uh, nourished my, my mind. It's maybe because of this that I am here in, in front of you today, you know. I don't know, actually, why I'm doing all of this. Uh, our distinguished presenter, um, um, pan, uh, chair mentioned that I was an um, arbitrator in commercial issues and investment issues. At the same time, he said that I was chairing the commission of inquiry um, on Burundi. When I said that, when I said that I was a judge at the African Court, I, I'm chairing the commission of inquiry at the United Nations. I was also a special rapporteur at the United Nations. People say, well, "Why? Wow! Wow! It's very impressive." But, and then when they asked me how much I earn, I said, "But not nothing." It's uh, totally, it's pro bono. How come you work pro bono? I say, yes, I work pro bono. And this is what I've been doing for the last 30 years uh, with the African uh, Yearbook of International Law, the African Foundation of International Law, and the African Institute of International Law. This is pro bono work. Uh, so I spend all my life uh, working for the, credit, for the business card, in a way, because I have a nice CV. Uh, but now, re lately, I realize that uh, I have also to work for the credit card. That's why I'm trying to do some arbitration work. But at the same time, my fate, my destiny, I would say the Muktoub, <clears throat> brings me to still be very involved with um, the rule of law. And this is why uh, I am director, now I accepted to become director of the African Institute of International Law, which is also a pro bono work. We don't have much staff. My team is here, Matthias. So that's it. And this uh, institution uh, has been uh, created 12, uh, 11 years ago. Um, at the initiative of Judge Abdelhawi Yusuf, who is judge and the former president of the International Court of Justice. So I've been working with him on a pro bono basis for the last 30 years. And I'm very glad to be here today to speak about the rule of law, because the rule of law is the, the main objective, actually, that the African, the African Institute um, is trying to promote and to strengthen. And the, the rule of law, actually, is a multifaceted concept. It's not easy to define what is the rule of law. So I'm, I'm very glad to be here today to share my views on the, the rule of law in my various capacities. You know, um, I started my career by teaching at the law school, first by doing my PhD at the Graduate Institute of International St uh, Studies in Geneva, and then I had the chance to talk at the law school in Geneva. And then I left for New York as a legal officer for the UN um, the, the, the legal department, the office of the, the legal counsel. I resigned, I was bored. I was in New York actually, it was nice, it had a nice office, nice view on the East River. But I was bored two years, I wanted to do something more practical. And I remember <coughs> my parents went to, went to visit me, I, I invited my parents in New York, so we made helicopter tours, etc. I took them to the delegates' lounge. They were very impressed. And at one stage, I decided to resign to go to Rwanda, just uh, to do something of my life. Um, and then I went to Rwanda. I resigned from the UN because I didn't have a permanent position. I resigned from the UN in New York. I went to Rwanda. It was the first ever um, peacekeeping operation integrating the human rights dimension. It was the first human rights mission in Rwanda with UNAMIR. So I went then, it was at that time the first, um, 
High Commissioner for Human Rights, Ayala Lasso. So I went there, I arrived with a jean, with nothing. At that time there was nothing, no security, nothing. Not even a pen, not even a badge of the UN. So I went there, but before going there, I, rem I remember my father, I was in France, I was packing my suitcase. And I, I packing my suitcase, so I was taking uh, gloves, I was taking some products, you know, some um, bau uh, tiger balm that you can put here, so you can smell the, 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 the smell of the death, because I was advised to, to bring with me a tiger balm, a mosquito repellent, and I had a pair of boots, minor, coal miner boots. They, those belonged to my uncle. He was working when I was born in early 60s. He was working with these boots. Each of, of one was almost one kilo weight, you know, real caoutchouc. My father said, but why, why are you going? What, what is the boots, the purpose of the boots? <laughs> I said, I'm going to, to Rwanda. I said, what are you going to do there? I, I saw you with a suit in a nice armchair in New York. Now you go to the, to the mud. He said, I'm very disappointed. So you are deceiving me. So he left, I packed, and I left. I stayed three months in, uh, <coughs> in Rwanda. I resigned for certain reason because I lost my illusions about uh, peacekeeping operations and human rights st stuff. And I, was, I resigned again from the UN. I was hired by the International Court of Justice. I stayed there 12 years. And then I was elected as a judge at the African court, where I stayed 10 years. Then I left, and I became a special rapporteur, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just to make a long story, sh uh, 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 a long story short, um, I tried to, to change the world in various ways, you know. Uh, but as a, a famous rock band, British rock band used to song, say in the, to sing in the early 71, in, the, in 1971, I remember, uh, I would love to change the world, but I couldn't do it, so I leave it up to you. Actually, I will not leave it up to you, I will still work with you to change the world. But what I learned is that uh, think global, but act local. So that's what I'm trying to do. I wish I can make lots of money, with my arbitration work, so I can change the world in my way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. Yeah, I think the same song says at one point, you say you want a revolution, we would love to see the plan. And uh, basically, this is what we're going to talk today. I mean, what, what, is, the, what is the plan to change things and, and to consolidate further the rule of law? Just stand over, please. Well, good morning to everyone. I'm Alexandra Sandoval. I'm from Colombia. Uh, English is not my first language. So I prepared a little speech. I'm going to read it. And I hope you like it. I'm 40 years old, and I have never lived in a country in peace. I was three years old when my father and other 100 people were killed when a guerrilla group called M19 tried to take the Supreme Court of Colombia as a hostage, and the state army responded in a disproportionate way. In the early 90s, when I was growing up, my country faced the confrontation of two drug cartels. On those years, it was common to hear the bombs that exploded in the main cities, causing hundreds of innocent victims. During that time, at least 40 judges were killed every year. At the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, another guerrilla group, FARC-EP, had taken half of the country, half of the territory, and kidnapped for financial purpose at least 6,000 persons. Because of that, paramilitary groups were created and they committed infamous massacres all over the country. In 2016, we signed a peace agreement between FARC, that at the moment was the biggest guerrilla group in the country, and the state that made us believe that the war was ending. But sadly, today my country is again in a severe risk. New armed groups are gaining again the control of the territory and the security of the civilian population is in danger. Through my life, I have seen how we change the name of the ones that produce the violence. 
how we hope we are going to achieve the ideal of a society that do does not resolve their problems by killing each other. But at the end, it all starts all over again. It seems that we are condemned, like Garcia Marquez, our Colombian novel, once wrote, to 100 years of solitude, that famous book. Despite this horrible situation, let me explain to you why Colombia is not a failed state. Although it has been in a war for 60 years that has produced 10 million victims, Colombia has maintained a strong array of rule of law institutions. My country, despite all of this I have been telling you, has a strong legal system and particularly an independent judiciary. Indeed, we survived the 90s because the state, but especially the judges, did not vent to the money and violence of the drug dealers. Many died doing their job, but also defending our institutions and putting limits to the exercise of power. The judges have been working in very difficult circumstances, but their effort has allowed us to document what had happened during the armed conflict and try to create legal solutions to each crisis. We had applied different legal solutions, from broad amnesties that we gave in the 90s to different types of transitional justice proceedings, including reparation programs for the victims and truth commissions. Colombia has used the rule of law as a way of resistance to violence. Therefore, the country maintains, at this moment, certain stability and trust in their institutions, and that implies economic development, political participation, and the exercise of democracy. Currently, I'm a, one of the judges in this tribunal that was created after the peace agreement of 2016. And this tribunal was created to investigate and sanction the gross human rights violations and war crimes committed before the agreement. It is true that we have not found the solution yet, but I strongly believe that applying the rule of law gives us hope, and hope gives us the strength to keep fighting for the dream to have a different country. For example, the current president of my country, Gustavo Petro, is a form former member of the uh, guerrilla group M19 the group that I told you that was involved in the murder of my father. It took him 30 years since his demobilization, this word is always difficult for me, uh, to win the presidency. That he is now in power is the living proof that violence was not the path. Only the completely respect of the rule of law will allow Colombia to achieve a long lasting peace. Thank you very much. A very good morning to you all. My name is Revai Obek, and I come from Zimbabwe, and I currently serve with the United Nations Development Program as advisor on justice and security. The topic we are discussing today, rule of law, democracy, sustaining peace. How does that translate into a personal story? For me, it began immediately when I finished the university. Armed with my law degree and having specialized in gender studies, I was ready to take over the world. I was ready to work for women's rights. I was ready to work for the marginalized communities. I was given an unprecedented opportunity. An organization for women lawyers had just been formed in my country. So immediately, I was given the opportunity to become one of the first lawyers to provide legal assistance to women in vulnerable communities. 
I took that with youthful energy, with enthusiasm, and I went out into the communities. I started providing legal assistance. By the way, I truly, truly believed in the law as the solution for the injustices that women were facing in the home, in the community, and in the nation at large. But you can imagine, after a few years of doing this work, listening to these stories, distraughtful stories of women, day in, day out, 30, 40 stories in a day, there was one personal impact that this year on me. At some point, I said, forget it. I know I'm expected to get married at some point. I'm not doing it. It's not worth it. That was one thing, because I felt the institution the way patriarchy was entrenched, and also the way patriarchy was entrenched in the law itself was not the way I wanted to live my life. So I'll fast track further in terms of what then happened. After being frustrated so much about the work that I was doing, kind of expanded the, the spectrum of the work. Let's get into the communities was the solution. Let's empower women. Let's empower vulnerable communities so that they are aware of their rights, so that they are able to assert and protect their rights way before anything seriously damaging happens. And by the way, the spectrum of issues that we were dealing with at the, tri at the time, in particular in terms of family laws, inheritance was a big issue. A lot of women would be disinherited from the property that they worked, that they worked so hard for. And at the time, for me and my country, we were going through the most ravaging period of HIV pandemic. We were experiencing death, Morning, evening, nights, every weekend was a time for burial. But what did that mean when it came to translating it for the rights of women and inheritance? It was a challenging situation. The next aspect that we looked at was, okay, we are doing all the empowerment processes, we are providing the legal aid as much as we can, but the law itself is problematic. We need to change the law. How do we change the law? I think this is really, for me personally, I found the most difficult process. I didn't realize back then in my youthfulness and possibly my naivety at the time that changing the law takes years. Eventually also implementing the law and making it a reality for vulnerable communities and for women also takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of years. It so happened, it so happened that during that time my country was going through a constitution reform process. We were like, yes, this is the holy grail what better place than the Constitution to fully entrench the rights of the communities, to fully entrench the rights of women, to fully entrench the rights of all citizens. We went back to the communities and shared with them this big news. We started talking about the Constitution and galvanizing women and communities' energies and power to say, come to the table. Yes, the table was full of political actors. So you can imagine when women came, to the table and shared their narratives of encountering the law, of injustices, but seriously putting to the table, we need our rights fully protected. Gender equality, equality of the sexes, rights to land, rights to property, how can all of this be fully entrenched and protected by the Constitution in the first instance, and how can all of this eventually be fully implemented? Again, in my naivety of expecting something quick to happen, it took us years to eventually come up with a new constitution. But one thing that I know for sure is it's a constitution that is much more robust, that is a departure from the previous one, but one of the key things that comes out of it is, and I do believe was a key aspect, was the people's voice, people's agency, and people's participation. Yes, we do have institutions, of rule of law, of democracy, critical and important as they are, they are nothing without the voice of the people. So you will see that throughout our engagement, the aspect of people-centric, listening to people, today we talk of the language of leave no one behind within the context of the sustainable development goals, right? And again, I think this is really a critical and a central part in whatever context we are working, at the community level, at the national, at the regional, at the international space, in the international spaces, we should never forget 
that if whatever it is we do, we have to fully and respectively reflect the voices of the people and the voices of the citizens. I will end on a personal note, which is to say, my name is Revai, and I know there are some Zimbabwean colleagues who are in the room. Uh, somebody told me, uh, just as I was growing up as a young girl in the village, that Revai means to just talk. And I thought to myself, no, that's not what my name means. My name means to speak out. And for that reason, I do believe that engagement, giving people the opportunity and the right to speak out, is part of building democracy, sustaining peace, and strengthening institutions of rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, Revat. Sullivan, your turn. You can, you can hear me, right? I don't, you don't have to activate it. Um, it's an honor to be here, um, and um, I, I know I'm mostly expected to speak about our work um, in Ukraine, um, how it has been affecting us, and how we see this, um, uh, this, this, this conflict going on and ending um, in, the, in, the, in the nearest, we hope, uh, future, and how um, we can contribute to that. Um, but in this part, um, we are more expected to speak from the personal perspective. Um, and I must admit, a lot of things that's happening in Ukraine right now, um, I can resonate with that very easily, unfortunately for myself and for my country as well, because um, the country I come from, Georgia, has been through very similar experiences um, more than once um, in the um, rather recent um, history. Um, so I was born in Georgia. Um, I grew up there. Um, my childhood and my teenage years coincided with the years when the Soviet Union um, started collapsing and then eventually collapsed. Um, and that was the time of um, um, military conflict in the civil wars throughout the um, southern and um, eastern parts of, uh, of the Soviet Union. With 11 or 12, I could, by, by its sound, I could distinguish what kind of uh, small guns um, were, were used, um, and I knew um, whether it was serious enough to, to seek shelter or not. Um, we didn't know uh, anymore how uh, the central heating uh, worked and what it meant. Uh, my father somehow gained access to a, a battery from a tank, which, if charged, could survive like two weeks. Um, so we had a source of uh, kind of uh, improvised electricity. Um, so once I was back um, with uh, Fabrizio um, uh, in, in Ukraine in May last year, it kind of felt like traveling back uh, in, in, in my childhood because when we arrived in Ukraine, there was no electricity. There was um, rarely you could see cars in the, in the, in the streets. And there were no children or no young people um, in, 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 in the streets, mostly uh, men, mostly um, elderly people. Um, and back then in, in, in Georgia, I could see um, uh, how, how difficult it was to restore peace and to start um, working on justice part as well. Um, but the difference now was I could contribute to this process in Ukraine, not just, just witness. Um, and there was one particular place um, which I felt I had uh, made a difference on professional but also on the personal level as well. A um, rather small city for Ukrainian terms, half a million, a big city for, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at it from the, uh, from the European uh, perspective, from the Western European uh, uh, perspective, um, where um, at the, the Azov Sea, um, where when I first arrived in 2016, um, the ruins were there still to see uh, from a brief but very violent um, conflict with the same, um, with the same neighbor. Um, and what we decided back then was that we needed a very, we usually we call it low-hanging fruits, but that's, that's, that's not the right expression. We, we, we were looking for something that could be fixed quickly but would have an impact on, on, on the community on the ground and create hope first, um, and then probably trust as well um, in, the, in, the, in the state institutions and in, 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 in life uh, as, as a whole. So we, we, we found this um, abandoned um, 
Soviet-style um, cinema theater on the left bank of the city. Um, the city's name is Mariupol, which uh, you, you have heard probably about, uh, which suffered the most uh, for us throughout this war. So we helped uh, to, 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 to change this abandoned, um, devastated place into a new landmark uh, of uh, where, where more than 400 public services were provided to people, starting with marriage registrations uh, to obtaining um, driver's licenses. And it got so involving and so fulfilling that at some point I ended myself not just helping with designing the functional areas within the building, which obviously was my job, but also sitting next to the designers and like you know looking to that uh, how the doors should be should be you know, evolving doors or the or other styles of doors should be installed, um, and even choosing the colors and everything. Um, and I I think rarely had my job been so tangible in terms of the results that were created. Um, and when we, end of 2019, went there and with, together with President Zelensky and lots of ambassadors, um, opened this place with hundreds of children playing you know, in front of the, of the building, um, it was probably one of the most fulfilling uh, moments in, uh, in my professional life. I took a couple of pictures there, uh, which I still have on, on my phone with, with these children. And then just five or maybe 10 days into the war, I once again received pictures from people um, who uh, happened to be in the Mariupol with the same building, or rather what remained um, from the building. And um, interestingly, even, the, in, even the, the focus or the angle of the uh, photographs was the, was the same as, as, um, as I was, um, as, as I had taken them. And you, you cannot really focus on anything else looking at these pictures now, comparing them, just wondering, like, are these children still alive? Are, are, they, are they safe? Um, did they end up in any of the infiltration camps? Um, have been they abducted? Um, are they now forced to speak a different language in a different country and become something completely else than they would have been in, um, if, if this war didn't have happened. So, and then we have no idea of, um, of the people we worked back then, whether they are still there, whether they have survived this conflict. But it's also um, as tangible as it has been as, a, as, a, as a, an achievement back then. I think this building is another very tangible goal uh, for me as well. The day we go back there and I get another chance to help rebuilding the same building, I think that could consider, from my perspective, a very strong sign that peace has been restored in this part, and then we can start working on the justice part as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. So now we, I think we're going to change the format and we're going to invite all panelists to the floor once the stools are up there. that no one falls from the camera. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a balancing act up here. So let's see how it goes. Exactly. So let, let's start with, with the judge to, to my right. And, and the African human rights system, in particular the African uh, call for, for, for human and people's rights, perhaps and this is, a, I think, an unfair reality, is less known in terms of the, 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 the case law that it produces, the, 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 the system, the way it works, uh, than its counterparts in Europe or, or, or the inter-American human rights system that seem to have been able to kind of like sort of come, you know, 
advertise themselves a bit better, perhaps, or kind of like disseminate some information about what they do better. And yet, for everyone that scratches the surface, the importance of the African court is, is clear. It's, it is a key instrument. It, it has really produced some remarkable case law as well. Of course, like in any human rights court, there are shadows and lights, right? I mean, areas of basically, you know, very, very strong contributions and areas where perhaps the court, like any court, has been a bit weaker. But what I, maybe you can share with us, Judge, I mean, a, a bit of a, some, some ideas as to what your experience is, and, and in particular, access to justice in, in the context of the, of the court. I mean, how, how does the court contribute to improving people's lives? And how can ordinary people in the region, you know, resort to the court for, for redress? How many minutes? Uh, no. <laughs> you ask me so many, so many questions, you know. <laughs> well, just give me the, 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 the three minutes. I, I, will try, no, I will try to do my best, you know. First, I'd like to, to tell that I was very, maybe I, I left a very pessimistic note with my presentation uh, before. I just want to say that I might have lost my illusions, but I still have kept my ideal alive. So I'm still uh, very keen, I mean, in the promotion of the rule of law and doing my, my job as, a, as an educator because I thought that I, I'm thinking now, I'm sure that education is the key word, actually, education. Not only of, at the university level, but I, I wish I could, do, I could start writing books for kids. You know, I have a four years old daughter and a 26 years old one. So one is at a university, the other one is at the kindergarten, and I think it starts there, it starts at the kindergarten. So I wish I had enough money to teach the youngest in Africa. Uh, this uh, being said, I'd like to make maybe a quick link between the African court and the rule of law. The rule of law. Actually, the rule of law, um, the African court um, is born, but it's is born in, 90, 90, in 2004, but the roots of the African court can be found in 1961 at the Conference on the Rule of Law in South Africa, which was organized in, uh, no, sorry, in Lagos, yeah. Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos, Nigeria, organized by the International Commission of Jurists, which is a, a non-governmental organization based in Geneva. So there was a conference. This conference was, um, was organized in 1961. It gathered um, 192 um, justices, judges, uh, legal profession, I mean lawyers and teachers from 23 African states and nine African, uh, non-African states. So it was in the midst of the decolonization. And then they adopted this uh, famous um, declaration, the resolution on the rule of law, in which they de define what is the rule of law and they say that it's a dynamic concept and I still agree that it's a dynamic concept. And they also proposed that uh, the African states, the newly independent African states, should adopt a human rights convention, and sh they should also devise a human rights court accessible to the individuals. 1961. It took 20 years to get an African charter on human and people's rights. African charter of human people's rights, which was adopted in, Mon in, Mon in Monrovia, uh, in, no, in, uh, in Kenya, in Nairobi, but the decision was, uh, was given in 1979 by the head of states in Monrovia to, uh, to, to draft a uh, human rights instrument. So it was adopted in 81, very quickly, less than three months. I never see, I, I don't have any example of a convention which has been drafted within three months. Three months, so that's why it was a very imperfect document very loose document, you know. It was muchly criticized when it was adopted in 91. <clears throat> so it took again 17 years, 1998, to get a protocol to, the, to this uh, convention to create a court, to create a court. Um, so the court was finally established in 2006 and I had the privilege to sit on this court. I had the privilege to sit uh, 10 years on this court and uh, we built the court from scratch, buying ch chairs, paper, pen, computers, designing robes, etc., etc. And our very first case, we decided it in 2013, 10 years ago. I still remember it was, uh, we decided the first case on the merits. Huh? Uh, it was a case introduced by um, uh, an NGO and um, a Reverend Mitikila. We have, we have here in the audience, uh, two uh, distinguished uh, high uh, 
judges, chief justice, chief justice, chief justices from Zanzibar and uh, uh, Tanzania. So this case was introduced against Tanzania by the Reverend Pitikila and an NGO. And uh, Reverend Pitikila was complaining um, about his political rights. He wanted to run for the presidency, but he was prevented to do so by a provision of the constitution, which was uh, uh, putting as a condition to run for the presidential election, either to be part of a political party, to be a member of a political party, or to be supported by, nominated by a political party. And Reverend, Reverend Metikila said, no, I will just run by myself. So this, this provision of the constitution is violating my right to association, because I, or right not to be part of an association, and my right to participate freely in the public affairs of my country. So the court has to deal with this case, and the court considered that there was both a violation of the right of association of Reverend Mitikila and his right to participate freely in the uh, public life of his country. So this was the first case uh, on which I participated. And the last case dealt also with political rights. It was introduced by the Association pour la Protection des Droits de l'Homme, uh, which is an Ivory Coast um, NGO. It was uh, uh, filed against Ivory Coast. Um, and the, the, the complaint was that uh, there was an electoral commission which was created to monitor the election. And the composition of this um, uh, commission was uh, allegedly not fair because uh, the majority of this commission was appointed by the head of state, by the executive. And uh, this NGO complained, said, no, this is not a fair body. So it has, it has to be structured and composed equitably. So the court decided that effectively this was not fair. The composition of this commission was not fair and asked the government of Ivory Coast to change its law in order to have a, a fairer institution to monitor the election. So those are the two examples how the African court contributed to um, the promotion of um, political stability on the African continent and to promote, actually, um, fair participation to the public life. So this is what I can say now. I mean, I can speak later on, if you like, on about access to justice, etc., cetera, et cetera. Because, uh, yeah, because otherwise I will also leave some room to my speak. The other speakers. Uh, Alexander, so let, me, let me turn to you. And, and the special jurisdiction for peace is um, uh, uh, now a critical um, component of the um, Colombian justice system. It's a novel institution. Mm -hmm. and it's a very creative institution because you come from a country of very creative jurists that mm -hmm. come with really good solutions, a very you know, uh, ingenious solutions to, to, to problems that would basically you know, probably overwhelm <laughs> some in the other nation. Um, now, how is the special jurisdiction for peace contributing to the sustainability of the peace agreements in, in Colombia. How is your chamber contributing with us or within, within, within that, that system? Well, it, it's a difficult question, uh, but I will try to explain. Uh, in 2016, when the peace agreement was uh, signed, we had a huge debate because we had to give the ex-combatants of the farc -EP some benefits. Otherwise, they were not going to give up the weapons. You had to give him chances. Uh, otherwise, the, the war will continue. At that time, uh, FARC had 12,000 combatants. So you can imagine how big this army was. But on the other hand, you had millions of victims. So uh, to give them a broad amnesty, was not possible, not only because international law at this point don't, does not allow the states to do that. Uh, what happened in Argentina, in Colombia in the 90s is not possible right now. Uh, but also because we had to give some uh, justice and truth and reparation to the victims. Otherwise, uh, well, we did nothing if we only say to them, okay, you can now participate in politics and uh, keep, uh, keep going with your life, and the victims are there. So we have this huge debate. Uh, and what we created is a system. The Special Jurisdiction for Peace, the tribunal, is just one part of the, that system, the justice part. But uh, we established two more institutions that uh, were really important for the victims in my country. 
One is the uh, Truth Commission that last year ended his uh, the mandate. They uh, made a report. It's huge, it's difficult to read it, but if you want, they have a really good web page, and it's also in English, where you can see the stories and uh, the information that they gather do the, during four years about the causes of the conflict, but most important, the voices of the victims. And, uh, well, they are trying to build a narrative of what had happened in my country. As I was telling you, when you have a country with a 60 years war, everybody has their own story. What I told you is just one story, but everybody has something to tell. So to try to construct a narrative that the whole country accepts, it's really difficult, and that was the main goal of the uh, report of the Truth Commission. We also have a unit uh, that is dedicated to find the missing persons, because something that uh, people usually don't know about Colombia is that we have a humanitarian crisis on that matter. At this moment, we have more than 120,000 persons that are missing. If you are from Argentina, you know that number is ha much higher than the ones you had uh, during the dictatorships. Uh, and by missing persons, we are not only thinking about the people that, for, exa for example, the state arrested and then you didn't know what happened to them. We are thinking about the people that was kidnapped by FARC and their families didn't know what happened to them. Uh, children that were recruited and their families don't know if they are alive or if they died on the war, in the war. So uh, basically this is well a matter of reparation, but also a matter of truth. When you found someone dead or alive, you are giving the whole story to the family. So you will see we have the Truth Commission for the truth. This unit uh, that we always say it's reparation, but it's also truth. Uh, we have an administrative program uh, for reparations of the victims for the 10 million, and we know we have 10 million victims because one of the things we did with this program is that people get and tell the story and they get the accreditation as a victim of the conflict. When they started, they thought that at least we were going to have 1 million, and now we are 10 million, and Colombia is a country of 55 million persons. So this tells you that at least each family has a victim of the conflict. So it's really difficult to have a program that is going to reparate uh, one quarter of the population. But that is our reparation program. And then they, we, they created the special jurisdiction for peace, the part of justice. And I'm telling you th this, this way because you can see that what we try to do in Colombia is what we try to respond to these four pillars of the transitional justice. Uh, truth, re uh, reparation, justice, and, um, well, and everything is a guarantee of non-repetition. Uh, the special jurisdiction, so I was telling you, is a, is a tribunal that uh, the main goal is to investigate and to judge and to sanction the uh, human rights violations, war crimes that were committed during the conflict. But I told you at the beginning, we had to found a way because if we, if we had said at the time to the combatants, yes, give up the weapons, but you are going to pay 40 years in jail and you were, are not going to be able to participate in politics, well, basically, they will n have not agreed. So we, this is a, a special tribunal because we are using restorative, restorative justice. And uh, it seems creative for Colombians, for one part of the country is really creative, for another part it is not, because what is true is that we, we have a big et ethnic groups. We have 5% of the population is indigenous, and 14% of the population is Afro-Colombian. And these persons, the kind of justice they are used to uh, apply in their communities is restorative justice. 
actually they are teaching us how to, to do it. And uh, it's really interesting. What is in really novel is that we are using this kind of justice in a tribunal of a transitional justice. So what we do, we don't see, uh, we don't have a logic of a case to case. We do macro cases. This means that we aggregate the cases. It can be by the topic, for example, kidnapping that was committed by FARC. We also have another case that it's, at this point is really uh, well known. We call it false positives, but actually there are extrajudicial killings made by the army during the war. They killed civilians and then say they were combatants in order to show that they were winning a, a, the war, but these were regular people. They killed 6,000 persons by this way. So we have a macro case just by that. And uh, we are following the comments the, uh, of the FARCEP, the group that uh, we made the peace agreement, but also to the army, to the state army. And this was important for Colombians because if we gave benefits to FARC, but not to the army, then we will have created like a really big problem. Imagine that the, the ones in the army that committed this, this type of crimes go to jail and the other ones no. Uh, and my country is really divided uh, because of this kind of thing. So it was really important to give them not exact the same uh, treatment, but a similar treatment. So we, we do this. We have 11 cases right now opened. Uh, two of them are almost done, and the sanctions depend on three things. If the person uh, accepts responsibility, fully responsibility, tells the truth, also fully truth, and reparate the victims, they are not going to jail, but they have for five to eight years con to contribute in the reparation of the victims. And the victims, with the dialogue with the victims, are the ones that establish what they have to do. We have heard many solutions about this. Most, well, Colombia is also a poor country, so people most of the time have a lot of necessities. And they tell things like, okay, you destroy my town. What I want you to do is please build a, a, a school for the children. Uh, we also have uh, really big problems uh, with mines. Please take out the mines that you put and so that we can go back to the land. And uh, that's, well, basically what we do. And I, just one minute, in the amnesties do another part that is really important for the rule of law is that I, I give legal certainty to the combatants. What I do every day is I see the cases and I uh, establish what can we grant amnesties and what what and what uh, when we cannot uh, grant amnesties. We can grant amnesties to uh, facts that are, were not war crimes, but uh, what we do actually is we apply IHL directly every day. Uh, to see if it's possible to grant or not the amnesty. And this is also important because for these people, for the combatants, for the ones that uh, they demobilize, yeah. so really hard word to pronounce, <laughs> uh, to know what they are facing, if, if they have some legal closure, they can move on with their lives and that is also really important for the security of our country. Thank you, Sandra. Is it, thanks, that's super interesting. It's interesting also why for Spanish speakers demobilization is such a difficult <laughs> word, I mean, for me, for me too. Riva, let, let's, let's go to you, and, and um, UNDP has been, throughout the years, doing amazing work in, in, in terms of contributing to um, restoring the rule of law in, in conflict-torn situations. Um, uh, and, and you have learned through the years, and you have recalibrated some of your procedures and your approaches. You have recently tried to focus more on people-centered responses to, to, to rule of law violations and to uh, situations where you want to consolidate you know, 
the, the status quo whereby human rights are observed and respected. So what type of examples from, from, from these few recent trends and these recent experiences would, would you like to see amplified? And would you think, okay, this is, these are the things that I would like to scale up and, yeah. and, 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 and show in terms of you know, contributing to prevention and to, to, and to peace? Thank you so much. Um, let me start off by saying for UNDP as a global development organization, we are present in about 170 locations globally, and we are rolling out the rule of law program, which is connected to significant work on human rights, on justice and peace. And we are operating in development context, in context of crisis, in context of transitions, and I was really glad listening to the justice speak about Colombia, because we are also having some investments in exactly the process that she was describing today. And in particular, one of the key examples, and I think a key result, is the work that UNDP has been supporting for the Afro-Colombian, you know, to access justice in this whole transitional period, but in particular also to go back to those mechanisms and systems that are rooted within the community. And again, this is also where is one of the examples that we I could share and compliment, it's really about going back to the people, hearing what are the systems that they have. I know for sure not necessarily all systems have a rights-based approach or are, or are inclusive or as respect diversity, but I think this is also where through the global program, part of our work is to work with national partners and infuse you know, some of these uh, global norms and standards into these kind of processes. I would also like to cite uh, another example for us which is Central Africa Republic, where UNDP, um, in the recent years, uh, we're talking about two, three years ago, uh, managed to activate the Special Criminal Court for Central African Republic, and it's been now hearing its first few cases and passing its first few judgments. Not an easy context to operate in, but we know for sure that, yes, a criminal court has to be there, but there also has to be a process for transitional justice, for reconciliation, for peace. So in this regard, I think combining all these important and critical approaches is important. Now, when it comes to replication, and scaling up some of these innovative uh, ideas and ways of engaging and working, prevention of conflict, sustaining peace. There is one critical component I think that I want to add to this conversation, which is to say the crises keep multiplying. You know, in UNDP, we talk about you know, the poly crisis. We are talking about the climate change contribution even to some of these challenges that we are talking about today. We are talking about the global economic recession and its impact on cost of living and the whole sense of justice and injustices within communities. Now, how do we particularly then engage when conflicts challenges keep to multiply on a daily basis or on an annual basis. So this is really where I think some of the best examples and some of the best practices, in particular for conflict and transition countries, really come into play. And for development context as well, one of the offers for UNDP is really about high level policy advisories to institutions, because I think being an intergovernmental body, there is definitely a huge component about supporting institutions. But the more and more we engage in this work, the more and more we also realize the importance of a people-centered approach to doing this work. I'll share with you that most recently, we had an evaluation of our work uh, uh, under the rule of law, and in particular on access to justice, where one of the key points and key emphasis is in transition, in crisis, in development, or in humanitarian context, continue to put the voice of the people at the center. Institutions are there to save the people and not the other way around. And I think this is really part of the global messaging that comes from UNDP and the work that we are doing, and we need to keep replicating and scaling it up moving forward. Great. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Levin, uh, again, you are the challenge of coming after all these other great stories and, and, and great thoughts. Um, you have a unique experience in, in, in uh, supporting institutions in Ukraine from a very different angle. First, you, you work working with the Office of the Prosecutor General in uh, the anti and, and the judicial system in the anti-corruption uh, anti efforts and the strengthening of the institutions in that regard. E-governance, uh, better governance for people, the Mario Paul Center story that, uh, with, with the tragic ending that you shared with us. And now, uh, the 
strengthening of the capacity of the Office of the Prosecutor General to deal with the current investigations and prosecutions on war crimes, um, uh, which I have the privilege to, to work with you on, on that program. What are your thoughts in terms of how, is, how this is contributing to, to the rule of law, how this, I mean, in, in, in the different ways, and in particular this last push for accountability in the context of this tragic time conflict. How do you see that in terms of, apart from the obvious desire to provide justice for the victims, is this also galvanizing broader support for the rule of law and respect for human rights within Ukraine, for instance? That's a hope um, that it does. Uh, but looking at what work the pre-trial investigators and prosecutors are doing in Ukraine right now in this context, I think that there are three dimensions that can be uh, distinguished in, in which this um, should help with strengthening peace and um, um, delivering justice um, as well. Um, first, obviously, is the, the very basic function of uh, the prosecution service and the trial investigation to register the cases and um, collect evidence and bring these cases to the to the court and seek justice uh, for those two um, who, who, who have suffered. Um, the second dimension is, um, I believe it's healing too, um, contributing to the healing. Because when, when, we, when we usually speak about delivering justice, in most cases we think about the court. The case is being decided in the court and the punishment being um, delivered. But the process starts long before, and sometimes it never ends in the, in the court. So in many cases, or in all cases, the prosecutors and investigators are kind of first responders um, who get in touch with the survivors and the, with the victims. And whatever understanding of the process, survivors and victims um, uh, and witnesses gather, that, that comes from the interaction uh, with the prosecutors and, um, and, um, and investigators. Obviously, they need to do their job in a proper way so that the, 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 the evidence they collect uh, is admissible and the case is uh, properly put together, but also in terms of the soft skills, the way they approach these people, um, that, that, that greatly influences um, um, the, the survivors and, and witnesses and their families and, 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 and uh, the society's understanding of um, whether there is a hope for justice. Because before trust, there needs to be hope. If there is no hope, um, uh, that this will ever, ever um, change or ever be restored, um, then, then obviously there will be no, no, no trust. And the last dimension, I believe, is um, prevention. Um, now, we had this, at least, at least in our part of the world, um, this illusion that after World War II, uh, with all the horrible experiences, the full-scale wars, the, 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 the time of full-scale wars was gone. Um, and it would never, ever, ever happen. Um, um, tragically, we were, we were wrong. Uh, and we see very similar um, conflict um, at the moment in terms of uh, the forces involved, like the, the scale of destruction. Uh, in some cases, even the front lines are exactly the same, and the way they are fought um, are exactly the same um, as they were uh, some 80 years ago. Uh, but still, there is a hope that some change could be brought uh, through this new experience, um, which would help in the future, if not completely eliminating uh, that kind of risk, then, then reducing or then, uh, managing them. Um, because the pro one of the problems Ukraine is uh, facing right now, and its, um, its criminal justice system is facing, is that the, the, the result of this um, prolonged, peaceful, uh, uh, existence uh, where IHL, ICL, war crimes, these concepts were not very relevant, neither in the, the law schools nor, nor in the legislation. And all of a sudden, there is this huge war, which is a political challenge, military challenge, social, uh, social challenge, but it's a legal challenge as well because the system is not at all prepared for that. There is no specialization, there is uh, no um, uh, clear legal definitions in the, in, the, in the legislation. So this needs to be done in, uh, uh, I mean, uh, learned in, in, in the process. So I, I, I hope this, this too helps, uh, the, the prosecution helps, uh, can help with uh, um, raising awareness and keeping us mindful of the fact that peace cannot be taken for granted. It needs to be reinforced, but it needs to be also, uh, the preparations need to be done for the worst cases so that the system is, uh, is ready to deal uh, if a crisis similar to that uh, um, ever happens uh, in the same place. Thank you so much. Thank you. So it's over to you now. 
Um, and as I said at the beginning of um, this event, you are strongly encouraged <laughs> to participate. And it will be great to, to get your questions and your views. Uh, so please, go ahead. Raise your hand. Yes, we have two here, Michael at the back, and then you, Pan, yep. Oh, why don't we start with you? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. You're, you're, going, to get, you're going to get a mic. So um, it's all very high tech in this place, isn't it? Thank you so much. Hi, well, thank you very much for your presentation. My name's Natalie. I'm with the Legal Empowerment Fund, a program for the Fund for Global Human Rights. Um, we're in the business of providing grants to grassroots groups working on access to justice and encouraging communities to know, use, and shape the law. I'm curious in each of your contexts, what, um, what are the barriers that community groups or community organizations face in um, improving the rule of law in these contexts or um, shaping the law and how, how can maybe we overcome these barriers? Okay, why don't we take Michael's question as well and then we put both questions to the panel? Yep, Michael. Thanks, uh, hi everybody, Michael Warren from IDLO. Um, my question is for uh, Justice Sandoval. Um, the special jurisdiction, as Fabrizio mentioned, is an incredibly original institution. Ultimately, it's a, it's a formal and state-anchored institution. I would be curious to hear your perspective on the role that uh, customary, indigenous, community-based processes of transitional justice might play and how the work of the special jurisdiction intersects with those processes at, at uh, local level. Thanks. Okay, so let's deal with those first two questions and then we move to you two. Yes, is that okay? Good. So why don't we start with that one? And maybe the, the first question, I'll deal with that one on my hand you do, but maybe you want to focus more on the second question. So why don't we start with the 11 and we'll do it the other way around? With the, um, well, with, 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 the, with the first question. Yeah. With the grassroots. Um, it depends on the, on the circumstances. At the moment, in Ukraine, it's pure security, um, whatever you do. In, and unfortunately, it, it has been the case for, for a um, couple of years now, because um, in countries like Ukraine, rule of law activities, in most cases, have a very significant anti-corruption um, component to it, which obviously means um, that you are getting yourself in trouble with the most powerful uh, groups or individuals um, in, in, the, in that country, um, whatever country it is. Um, and we, we have seen uh, tragic uh, uh, cases uh, of, um, um, when, of, of revenge when, when uh, civic uh, activists, especially uh, not in the capitals, but uh, away from, from the uh, center, uh, political center of the country, um, where uh, where people were killed, um, anti-corruption civil activists were were, were killed, and um, um, this is um, this is when my I mean you mentioned you 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 fund that kind of activities, and this is where I uh, where I felt most conflicted uh, about that kind of um, work uh, being done in the field, because on the on the one hand we obviously wanted to encourage these people to do this work. But on the other hand, you also realize there's very little you could do for them if things go um, in the wrong direction, and they are very likely to go uh, into the wrong direction if the enemy uh, uh, um, who, who is being confronted is very powerful, rich, um, and even uh, institutionalized in terms of, in terms of the, um, um, the government presence. Um, so well, on the one hand, I, I, I can only admire uh, this direction in this work, but on the other hand, I'm very much mindful of our responsibility of putting people, or helping people get themselves uh, in, in danger. Very same point, basically to say, I think I heads off to all the human rights defenders and people working at grassroots level, oftentimes in crisis, conflict and transition context, which present a real danger, but I think it is their quest, for example, for accountability for the rule of law that drive them to engage. But when it comes to some of the barriers, the issue of security is definitely an issue. But I think there are some of these other barriers or challenges which sometimes look so obvious, but they kind of weigh heavily on them. Just access to resources, 
to be able to engage and do this work. The evaluation done for UNDP that I was talking about earlier, it also did reveal for us the declining investments globally in this kind of work. So oftentimes communities have to mobilize their own resources to be able to engage, often in most difficult and dangerous situations and circumstances. But we should also not forget the restrictive, in some instances, civic space. That just simply doesn't allow for that kind of level of engagement to happen. So oftentimes, again, the human rights defenders are pushing the boundaries of the law and the system and the authorities. And that by itself, I think, presents also a real danger uh, for themselves. Now, in terms of all these barriers and all these kind of challenges, I guess this is then one of the big questions. Again, as we keep emphasizing, let's hear from the voice of the people. Let's have people-centered approaches and agency. And yet, at the same time, the environment is not enabling you know, for that to happen. And I think that remains a big question where we have to draw from successful examples uh, implemented in other contexts to make this kind of work successful. I'll stop here. Shall so we have the judge first, and then Alejandra, you deal with both questions at the same time? Alexandra? Sorry. Actually, uh, actually, this question, I don't think it was really addressed to me. Both one of the questions, actually, are not uh, specifically addressed to what I mentioned. I, I, um, I tried to develop, you know, I didn't have a kind of a, a grassroots community approach. Uh, if I can make a general comment, actually, on the, on the theme of this panel, um, I'm, how can the rule of law sustain democracy and peace? What struck me in the discussion is that the one word, one keyword was uh, absent from the, the discussion and is absent from the title. And the word, uh, the word is, the key word is development. Mm -hmm. uh, development. So um, I didn't hear this word, uh, development. It's uh, United Nations Development Program, uh, International Development Law Organization. So the word development is everywhere, but it's not part. And of course, development is a key word to the rule of law. Rule of law is an ingredient to the development, and the development is an ingredient to the rule of law. So it's very important to put the emphasis on those two concepts. Uh, as uh, the Chief Justice, right, right Chief Justice of Zimbabwe last week in, uh, in Arusha stressed uh, concerning justice, he said that uh, we have to take a holistic approach to justice. Justice cannot just flourish without taking into consideration other issues like, uh, which are part of the rule of law. Justice is an integrant part of the rule of law, such as accountability, uh, participation, free participation to the to public uh, life. Um, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just uh, confused now because I have so many things to say about this. Uh, this issue of rule of law. Yes, so we have to take a holistic approach as well for the rule of law. It's not only access to justice, it's not only uh, uh, independence of the judiciary, it's also freedom, it's full freedom. Social justice, justice is also social. It's also social. So that's why uh, this has to be uh, taken up. We have to take a, a, a more um, a holistic approach of this issue of uh, of the rule of law. That's why I'm not very comfortable to discuss some approaches without taking into consideration the other, the other parameters. The other parameters, the, in a way, this is why also uh, I thought that uh, the African court, you see, we mentioned Colombia, we mentioned Colombia, what the Inter-American Commission, Inter-American court. court of Human Rights could do about violence in Colombia? Nothing, nothing. The court, I mean, a lot in the prevention, but uh, we are, Actually, judges, national or international judges, uh, we don't have any power in a way. You know, we can just come at the end to maybe to make some reparation and maybe to deter for the future. But this is not where the, we're just fixing things. But we cannot prevent them really. So we have to take a holistic approach and put all the ingredients in this, like the UN is trying to do, with human rights, peace, and development. Development, yes, development, social justice. Social justice. I'm always wondering why I live in Switzerland. You see, Holland is like Switzerland. There's nothing in, in Holland. Now they have, they, they have gas, they have, but no human res no natural resources. But still, you know, we have rich people here. In Africa, you have everything, but you have nothing at the same time. I'm traveling from Geneva to Africa. In Geneva, there's nothing but rich people. Poor country with rich people. I go to Africa, rich countries with poor people. What's wrong? What's wrong? 
So my, my conclusion is sharing, sharing the political power and sharing the resources. This is the basic. You have to share both of them, political power, resources. And it is, this goes th through the transformation of African citizens to African taxpayers to rebuild the social contract. We need to have a social contract. As long as you don't pay tax, you don't feel involved in the political life of your country. Here, you pay tax, you can see the result of your tax. You see, OK, this has been built. There's a playground for children. There's nice roads to cycle, nice infrastructures. So we need to have this in Africa as well, to build a social contract development. That's why the African Institute is not only working on social, on uh, building, I mean, uh, talking about access to justice or the rule of law. We are also trying to promote the investment in Africa. Because if you build the rule of law, you attract investors. Investors can come because they, trust in, they have, to have trust in the judicial system. So they can also promote development. We are also trying to promote trade through law, trade through law. This African free trade area, which has been put into um, motion two years ago in Africa, we are trying to, prom to promote it. It's the largest free trade area in the world, 55 African states. So development is the key word. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I went too far. <laughs> Just on the one. Um, well, on, on the first question, they said it all. Uh, it's the same. You were talking, and I, and I feel you were talking about my country. Imagine what, what is trying to do transitional justice in a, in a territory where there is no peace, where victims are afraid because new armed groups are there. Uh, so yeah, basically. And I could not more agree with you. You said it all. Like, we could finish right now. <laughs> uh, on behalf of your question, um, well, for the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, it has been really interesting uh, to work with the indigenous and the Afro-Colombian groups. Uh, but it's, it's a historical debt that we had with these communities. The constitution of my country, that is from uh, 1991, guaranteed uh, that uh, the way they live and the authorities had to be had to be recognized by the state, but uh, lastly, this is the first time that a, a tribunal is part participating and engaging directly with them, and we have done this uh, since the beginning. All of our uh, legal norms. Uh, were part of a prior consultation with the indigenous and the Afro-Colombian communities. Uh, but also they participate in every proceeding where a victim or one of the combatants uh, are part of the, one of these ethnic groups. The authorities, they participate directly and we talk and go directly to the territories. We have learned uh, that being in the territory, it's really important because uh, for them, the territory also suffered uh, the conflict. So uh, it's just not one person. It's just not the community, the river, uh, the jungle, the animals. They also suffer the, the, the conflict. And, and they made us, most of the time, make tributes to, to the territory uh, in order to repair it. Uh, the spiritual part, that for me, it was difficult to understand because I, I grew up in a different context, the spiritual part for the communities is really important. And if we don't repair that part, we are for them, we are not doing anything. Uh, and I, I will tell you that we have been able to do this job, not just because the Constitution says that we have to do it, but also because uh, in my tribunal is the first time in Colombia that we have real representation. And 53% uh, of the judges, we are women. And 10, we are 38 judges. 10 are uh, part of the ethnic groups. Uh, eight, uh, four are indigenous and four are Afro-Colombian. And this is really weird in my country. If you see the Constitutional Court, the Supreme Court, you will never find as many women and you will never find an indigenous or an Afro-Colombian. And it's not a matter of representation. It's a matter of uh, teaching us how to work uh, because they are there. Uh, 
for me, for example, I have someone to ask how I, I have to approach to the communities, how to work. Someone that explains everything to me so I can do my job well. So I, basically, that's why I think we are being able to do this. And right now, uh, particularly the indigenous uh, communities are, are helping us because I, I was telling you, we are starting to have the dialogues for the sanctions in which the victims uh, talk with the perpetrators and establish uh, what the sanction is going to be. And we are using restorative justice and uh, we have uh, had a lot of meetings with indigenous communities and they are teaching us the methodologies they use in their communities, how symbols are really important to have a really good dialogue and to get to a result. This is great, thank, thank you so much. Um, Raluca, uh, sir, first you and then, and then Raluca. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael. I'm asking this question as a researcher from Leiden University. And also, I want to thank IDOO for putting this um, impressive panel together. I also organized another event uh, in this Hague Justice Week yesterday. So I feel um, I'm really benefiting from this uh, whole series of different things. Um, I, my question first goes to Riva and then to Judge. I'm really glad you mentioned development in your last round of remark. Uh, in my research, I research on investment, going to Africa, and how that affects the human rights situations in Africa. I had the fortune to stay in, in Zimbabwe for a month for my research last year. I was really uh, saddened by, um, was very impressed by the resilience of the society, but also very saddened by the fact of the early marriage. When you mentioned the gender justice in Zimbabwe, I thought about that. Um, I understand one third of the girls um, get married, at least, um, conservative evaluation is that they marry before 18 years old, and that number is getting worse because the, um, again, conservative religious um, forces are propagating this uh, trend, and the politicians are once they are vote, basically. So um, it's a very challenging issue um, when you talk about human rights defenders, the activists working on the ground. When I talk with them, they feel a sense of disappear. I want to get your take on this uh, in that challenging situation. Uh, why? Um, like, what's your take on this? What's your suggestions, advice for us? Um, I'm glad that, Judge, you mentioned development because um, this is also what the, the question I'm asking. Someone is providing an answer. Um, this case, African or Zimbabwe's biggest investor, trading partner, China. This is also where I originally coming from. Um, they're saying economic development is all the answers to all the challenges African continent has. Um, so sometimes you hear this binary division: whether we want justice or we want GDP and everyone takes their own um, battle or stand. So I want to hear from your comments on this as well. Do we, uh, how do we move ahead in this very complicated complex? Thank you. Let's hear the second question, and then we'll go back to the panel. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Raluca Bopa from IDLO. And uh, first, I just want to thank uh, very much the speakers for their generosity in sharing these experiences with us and indeed uh, bringing this personal experience uh, um, to, to us as an audience. Um, and um, I, I work and I've worked for many years on issues of uh, violence against women and I continue to do that at IDLO. So I'm very interested in this issue of uh, how do people change? How do people change to live nonviolent lives and especially how do men change and how do militarized men change in particular. Um, so my question is, I, I was going to ask it to all of you, but I'm going to ask it to uh, Judge Sandoval. Um, and is how do we build peace that includes victims and perpetrators? And I'm asking it of you um, because I, I think it was mentioned many times that um, the special jurisdiction for peace is unique, potentially Colombian, the Colombian experience is unique. So then the question is, is, is it unique? Is that experience of trying to build a peace that includes victims and perpetrator side by side, um, is it unique? Uh, or what do you think we can learn from that? 
Shall we go then to, to you for the answers? Um, Judge, do you want to start and then to some other? Uh, to start where and to end where, I don't know, but <laughs> uh, I will come back to the, to the African system, actually. Uh, the Af I, I spoke before uh, about the rule of law, which uh, took, is taking its roots in, uh, in Lagos. So lots of um, accomplishment has been done since then on the normative level in the African continent, you know. Uh, the African states have adopted uh, major legal instruments, so they have uh, the, the normative. The normative fabric in Africa is wonderful. I think it's uh, it's far ahead of what has been adopted at universal level or in various regions of the world, except maybe in Latin America. Uh, <clears throat> one of the key concepts which has been put forward by the African states is the right to development. The right to develop. I mentioned before that the African Charter is a very poor instrument as far as the, legally speaking, technically speaking, but it's a very rich instrument as far as the concepts are concerned. And the African states in 1981, they put forward the right to development, but not the right of the individuals to development, which was promoted by the Western states. They put both right of individuals, but the rights of people which was a call for social democracy, but not only social democracy within African states, but at the global level, at the global level. It was a call on the international community, mainly rich countries, to not only give to the African state, but to share with them in terms of uh, deterioration of the terms of trade, transfer of technology, uh, building capacities. So this was the call launched in, in 1981. So this is what I wanted to say about uh, development. Uh, the African states have also made a major breakthrough in terms of political democracy. Political democracy condemning, for example, unconstitutional change of government, which is a, 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 an ingredient of the rule of law, you know, governments. Constitutional change, anti-constitutional change of government. In 2000, they have enshrined this in the Constitutive Act of the African Union. And in 2014, African states declared that unconstitutional change of government is a crime, an international crime. 14 crimes in the Malabo Protocol, 14 versus four in the Rome Statute. So, so this is what I wanted to say in faces on the right to development, which can be also developed. We can speak about that at length, you know. But I think it's very important to put the to put uh, the emphasis on the interrelationship between uh, economic development and the rule of law. They are nourishing it themselves, you know, both sides. So, justice is a beautiful flower, but it needs to grow when the soil is fertilized. And this is true at the national level and true at the international level. This is my conclusion as a judge. Actually, I, I expected a lot from the African court. And when I used to teach to civil society representative or anybody, I mean, this is what I say. Don't expect too much from them. I mean, don't underestimate the role of the African court. It is an important mm -hmm. tool. The same as at the national level. Don't underestimate the role of national courts of chief justices, but don't overestimate their role as well. The, the soil needs to be fertilized and plowed, plowed. So this is important. You need to have a, a soil which is fertilized. So the, it's not only the seed, it's important to have the soil and to fertilize it. So judicial culture, rule of law culture, it's not, it's not I mean, uh, enough to have uh, nice laws, good judges, but you need to have the culture around it. And this is my conclusion at international level. I believe in the African court, but it has lots of limitations. So that's why I'm trying now to work from the ground, the ground. Well, um, well, I'm a judge at the Chamber of Amnesties, but I'm also the coordinator of the gender perspective implementation in the special jurisdiction, so I have like two jobs, and you just ask me for, for, for my second job. And it's a difficult one. Um, the peace agreement in Colombia is the first peace agreement in the world that included the gender perspective uh, as a principle, but also it established a specific um, 
topics and measures that had to be granted uh, in all over the agreement. So when we started our job, we knew that we had to think how we were going to implement uh, the gender perspective. And uh, it seems easy to say it, but we know it's really difficult to do it in the practice. And uh, well, basically, because we have a restorative justice system that uh, is based on a dialogue between the victims and the perpetrators. But what we have known for what we have worked so far is that when a gender-based violence, including sexual violence, is involved, this gets more difficult. First, because some of the victims, they don't want to be confronted with the perpetrators. Uh, some of them want, some not. And you cannot force those victims to face them. It could be much worse uh, for them. So we have to deal uh, to create a, a proceeding that allows them to participate in the proceeding, but that they don't have to confront it, and that the, that doesn't mean it has any implications for them uh, in, the, in the proceeding. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing that we have seen is that uh, for the perpetrators, it is really difficult to recognize this kind of violence. Uh, for them, it's most, much, much easier to accept that they murder hundreds of people because th that's what you do in war, in war. You kill people. But to accept uh, sexual violence, even for them, uh, it's really, really difficult. And you start uh, hearing narratives like, uh, ah, no, we didn't accept that kind of violence we punish that kind of violence. Or that violence what was committed for just one person. It was not a political or, or a practice of the organization. You will start hearing these kind of things. So to put the victims on that situation, it's also really difficult. And the third thing is that we know, since we began, that uh, gender-based violence, including sex sexual violence, was not created by the conflict. Women and LGBTQY people suffer violence and discriminations in terms of war and in times of peace. What war does is that they increment the type of violence. And they, they put it in levels that you will never imagine. So if you want to change uh, this type of violence, it is not not enough to end the war. Because probably this woman will keep suffering different types of violence and discrimination if they stay in a society uh, like the one in Colombia. So what uh, we put one uh, article in our uh, norm norms of proceedings is that the sanctions uh, that we are going to create uh, when the crimes were uh, related to gender-based violence, they have to have a transformative perspective. Uh, in order to look to the causes, and the causes can be that society, the Colombian society is really patriarchal, and uh, that we have to face that and to transform that in order to end that kind of, kind of violence. So uh, we are working on it. I think it could be a good experience for other communities, but I, what I can tell you is that uh, to talk about it can be really easy and, and also inspiring, but to make it reality, it's really hard. River Levin, any, any thoughts? Sure, I'm gonna respond to the question around um, early marriages. Um, and sexual and uh, gender-based violence. So thank you for sharing your reflections from your study and visit um, to Zimbabwe. My opinion is that this is one of those cases where the prevalence, yes, of, we wanna call the marriages, I think it's a misnomer because really we are talking about minors, you know, in this case, children below the age of 18 finding themselves in some institution which we are calling marriage, and the prevalence, prevalence is high. But that is also coupled with very high prevalence of gender and sexual, based, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, broadly speaking. A lot has been done. 
I would say, from a legal perspective, in terms of go back to the constitution that I talked about when I shared my personal experiences. The guarantees of equality are there, and they are very clear. The right uh, of, uh, to marry and to choose when to marry so that it's not forced marriages is entrenched in the constitution. Subsidiary legislation has also been passed. The judiciary has also made a lot of effort to broadly interpret the constitution, the legislation, as well as international uh, norms and standards to protect all these rights. But unfortunately, I think this is one of those cases, and I agree with you, Honorable Judge, where it's an intersection where development by itself is a key ingredient to dealing with some of these issues. The law by itself, or the judicial institutions, and everything that they can do is not enough. So obviously, rising levels of poverty, more and more children, both boys and girls, falling back in their education and dropping out of school, or eventually finishing school, but there are no job opportunities because the development space and the economic space is not created in a mechanism and in a way that absorbs and encourages other ways of engagement. That then becomes, I think, the biggest challenge. So in this regard, yes, it is absolutely true. It's a fact. But the soil that needs to be nurtured and the seed that needs to be planted around these issues really will not start and end with the legal processes it's themselves. We really need a much broader engagement. Absolutely, social norms and practices, you know, religious practices, all of that you have to continue to be challenged. And again, we are dealing with structural issues here, which take years and years and decades to change. However, that doesn't necessarily mean the starting point, you know, yes, to, we, it doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't start challenging those cultural norms and systems. But coupled with that, definitely a broader development uh, spectrum and context need to be put on the table as part of solution finding. I fully agree uh, with the statement that uh, sexual violence does not start or does not um, happen because of the war. Um, this is what the war simply makes more uh, visible and uh, in some cases um, the scale at which uh, it is conducted it increases and the social approach to it also changes because the uh, um, doesn't become more to tolerable maybe but uh, it's considered part of the war, part of the new new reality. And the biggest problem is that it does not end with the war. Um, and thinking of uh, hundreds of thousands, of millions of people um, coming back home from, from the war, um, where they one thing they've learned is that violence is a response and violence is a solution, uh, and sometimes even the way of survival, well, this, that will create a whole uh, new uh, scale of, of, of issues and problems, especially um, for those who are the most vulnerable, children, um, elderly, um, disabled people, and women and girls uh, um, uh, among them. Um, currently, one of our uh, challenges is to make sure that the, that the system that is supposed to be in place to protect these people doesn't become part of the problem instead of being part um, of, the, uh, of the solution. And this is when, when, when I talked about the soft skills and the healing part of the uh, job of the prosecutors and investigators um, is that the way they treat uh, survivors and, and witnesses, and witnesses themselves are usually survivors as well because uh, um, as, as we can see, part of the uh, sexual violence um, committed is to to make witnesses witness something that makes themselves uh, victims of the um, of the violence, um, the way police um, treat this um, uh, these complaints, the way they they they, they work with these people, um, don't re-victimize them and don't additionally stigmatize uh, them. So this is the problem we are already facing. But with more than one million people coming back, as I said, um, we will have um, different levels of organized crime. We will have different uh, levels of um, domestic violence. Um, that's going to be a whole Whole new bunch of um, challenges which we um, need to be aware now. Um, unfortunately, there's little we can do about it because our resources are limited and we are focused on the most urgent things at the moment. But as, 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 as um, the situation evolves um, towards freedom uh, and, 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 and peace, I, I, I hope um, we will face a, a whole new bunch of uh, challenges, including. Well, I think we're going to, to finish here. Um, and um, it's been, I think, a fascinating morning. and. The number of things that resonate with, with me after the, the, the discussion, and 
first of all, there was an agreement with the panel that basically is the importance of putting the affected communities, survivors, the people, in, the victims in the center of the solution. But then we also heard, you know, that that in and of itself is not enough. I mean, if there's no one in the judiciary that can understand what the communities are saying, um, then it's impossible to have people-centered justice. So there Judge Sandoval tells us, well, you know, we have an inclusive approach to the special jurisdiction for peace, and we have representatives of the most vulnerable communities that can teach us that in the adjudicative process what these communities mean by the responses that they expect from us. So we can understand better, and we can work with the communities. So that level is saying, you know, we have sexual violence in Ukraine. We have the situation in Ukraine. We have a judicial system and, and, and a law enforcement system and a prosecutorial system that doesn't know how to, 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 to work with people, that doesn't know how to treat a victim of sexual violence, and probably would rather not investigate or prosecute a case of sexual violence. Uh, so how do you transform that mentality in order to make sure that the national system can truly react to that? Um, then we have the importance of development. To speakers say, well, look, I mean, the judicial process and you know, you know, rule of law can, and, and, and promotion for human rights actually don't, don't, don't happen in a vacuum. If you don't have the socioeconomic circumstances around them that basically promote that, that culture, um, it's, it's born to fail, the experiment. So basically, we have that. And George Vargas was saying, don't expect much from the judges. I mean, we have limitations as to what we can do. We are one piece within a much broader spectrum of, of, of solutions that had to be there in the toolkit. So I think in that sense, there's been a, a, a lot of coincidence between the different panelists. And I think two words that um, maybe stay with us for the rest of the day, trust, the importance of trust, and the importance of hope. So let's finish on that hopeful tone this morning. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the organizers uh, in Bell and Head Out for the, the support, the logistical support, and thanks a lot to, to the panel for, for their inspiring words today. Thank you.